passage of Scripture that was just read, if they in fact had a little time to examine it more thoroughly, they might question why we are talking about all six verses from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. They might say, Kevin, maybe you really just need to have one sermon on verses 19, 20, and 21 about where your treasure is and where your heart is. Somebody else might say, well, no, actually it would be good to do that, but then he could have a whole different lesson on verses 22 and 23 about the eye being the lamp of the body. And they might look at verse 24 and say, that's for sure a completely different lesson because that's talking about not having two masters. So why is it all lumped together into one lesson? And that's because these passages of Scripture have something very much in common. And it is Jesus' lesson on the choices that we make. The choices we need to make based upon the priorities in our lives that we should all understand. So this morning we're going to take a look at these choices. And we're going to begin by looking at verses 19, 20, and 21, talking about our treasures and our hearts. When Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, and ultimately concludes in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That was one of those passages of Scripture when I was younger that I never could remember which way it went. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, or is it where your heart is, there will your treasure be also? And if you'll think about it, uh, they're very, very similar. Uh, it's very, very easy to, under, to, to misunderstand or to, to, to conclude it in the reverse order in which God gave it to us. But when Jesus speaks these words, where your treasure is, He's talking about those things that are most important those things that we value the most. Now it's very easy for us to take a look at some of the physical things of this world, some of the possessions that we have, some of the money that we possess to see value. And in fact, going right along with what Jesus said here, that's exactly what James warned about in James 5 verses 1 through 3. When the brother of Jesus wrote, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. What Jesus is trying to get us to understand is trying to get us to embrace in our spiritual lives is the value of things. And the value of things that are temporary versus the value of things that are eternal. Is, it any, is there, there a wrong in valuing the shirt that I wear or the shoes that I wear or the clothes that you have on this morning? There's not a problem with having, placing a value upon it. But are those clothes the most important thing to you? There's certainly nothing wrong with the money that you have in the po your pocket or the value that you place on your home or your car. But are those things the most important things to you? You see, Jesus reminds us, that, reminds us that these things are temporary. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Moths, we understand, are things that usually attack garments. And if we go back in time, we think about if you go to a museum and you see things from antiquity, you can go in there and you can see uniforms of soldiers from World War II, from World War I, even the Confederacy. You might even in certain places find the uniform or a, a flag made out of a fabric that goes all the way back to the Revolutionary War. But you don't usually find in a museum a garment that was worn by someone 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, because those clothes just don't hold up over time. They rot, they decay, and if they're exposed to things like moths, they may be eaten away. One of the very reasons such a thing as mothballs exist, to keep those clothes preserved a little longer. But they're temporary. Even the money we have, I mentioned coins. These are things that you can find that go back 
a long period of time. I'm a coin collector, some of you may not know that, but I actually have some coins in my possession that go back to the days of Jesus himself. It's an amazing thing to hold in your hand, something that's been around 2,000 years. And yet, they're not as nice, they're not as shiny, they're not as perfect as they were when they were first created. In fact, some of these coins are so worn down just by the touch of so many people over the centuries that you can hardly make out any of the details. Eventually, they will cease to exist altogether. Even metal fades away. He even talks about the things that we might possess in our homes now that are important to us. If you were given the choice, if you knew ahead of time, for instance, that there was going to be a fire that was going to destroy your home, what would you try to save if you could save something? I don't really have to give that much thought. Outside of my family, I will point that out, I do want to save them. Outside of my family, what would I want to save more than anything else in my home? My computer. My computer. And I do have more than one, but the one that I have, the bulk of information that I have collected for 20 plus years of my work in ministry, all of the newspaper articles I've written, all of the bulletin articles I've written, all of the sermons that I've written, just recently, Connor said to me, as he was talking to me from his internship in Alvington, Kentucky, he said to me, he said, Dad, how do I know what to talk about? Where do I start? I've got all these lessons that I've got to prepare. What should I do? And I did to him what my dad did for me, except just in a little bit different fashion. I have the ability here in Florida to take control of his computer up in Kentucky. I took control of his computer and I moved a file over onto his desktop. He said, what's that? I said, Connor, that's every sermon I've preached since I've been in Florida. It's every PowerPoint. It's every scripture reference that I've used. He went, wow. Well, when I look back at that amount of information, I sometimes go, wow because it's a lot of information and I wouldn't want to lose it. I value it. So if a thief breaks into my house unannounced, if a thief breaks in to steal those things, what's one of the things that a thief is going to steal that has value today? He'd steal a computer. And perhaps with it, all of that work that I've amassed over the years. It's not a problem to value things. But the question is, where is our treasure? Do we treasure these things, our clothes, our money, our possessions? Do we treasure these things more than we treasure God? Now, I believe that it is often very easy for us to do that in the beginning, even as we are newborn babes in Christ, perhaps we do not have the love for God and the appreciation for Him that we'll have in the years of our maturity, but it's a goal that we should strive to possess. We should strive to possess the treasure of God, the treasure of our Lord, the treasure of heaven in our hearts, because where our treasure is, there will our hearts be also. And of all the things that we can love in this world, in this physical existence, the one thing that we know is that these things are going to perish. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth about running a race. And we, he takes us back to those early days of the Olympics, in essence. And he talks about, he says, Do you not know that all those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. That's because in the early days of these games, when you were the fastest man on the face of the planet, you didn't walk away with a gold medal like you do today. You walked away with a wreath of leaves on your head. That wouldn't last nearly as long as a gold medal. 
And we've already established that even gold will fade away. He says we're actually competing for something imperishable. We're competing for something eternal. And not suggesting that we're competing with one another, but we're competing with the desires of the world, the lust of the world that would try to get us to treasure them more than we treasure God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. There are, there are no imperfections in heaven. Heaven will not fade away. It is not something that will perish over time. It is the home of God. And it's the home that we should look forward to. And we should treasure Him who makes that possible. And we should treasure our Lord above all of the desires of this world. Sometimes though we put on a good show. We put on a good act. We put on a good front. And I'm just as guilty of this as anybody else because there are times when I take even my own spirituality more seriously than others. And that's a problem because we should always take the eternal seriously and more seriously than anything else. But isn't there time? Isn't there a time in our lives where we sometimes forget and we try to say and talk about and project the image that we embrace what is most important but in truth we actually don't. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. You remember the story of the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19 verses 16 through 24? It's in this passage of scripture that a, a ruler came to Jesus and said to him, teacher what good things shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now you remember what Jesus said, uh, ultimately he says to him, he says, there is only one who is good, but if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. So this ruler goes on to talk about, perhaps he was bragging, perhaps he was just clarifying the facts, but he goes on to talk about all of the good things he's done, all of the commandments that he's kept. You shall, he said, Jesus goes to him and says, You shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, All these things I have kept. If the story ended right there, it would have a very different ending. Indeed. But then he asked the question, What am I still lacking? What more can I do? What more should I do? And you remember the response of Jesus who knew his heart? He said, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and then come and follow me. And the young man went away sorrowfully because he had great wealth. You see, on the surface, who was this young man? He was a righteous man. He was a religious man. He was an obedient man. Look at all the things he did. He hadn't murdered. He hadn't committed adultery. He hadn't stolen. He didn't lie. He honored his parents and he loved his neighbor as himself. I heard one say, man say once upon a time, he's the kind of guy we would appoint as a deacon. I heard the same fellow say he's the kind of man you'd want your daughter to marry. Because on the surface, he looked good. But Jesus knew what was in his heart. Jesus knew where his treasure was. And his treasure was not in righteousness. His treasure was not in obedience. His treasure was truly his money. Because when asked to give up his treasure, to ask, when asked to give up where his heart truly was, he went away sorrowfully because he had great wealth. Jesus in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, told a parable about a rich man. And he said, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? 
Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is a good example of what we've said over the years. You won't see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Because when you die, whatever you've amassed, whatever you've accumulated will not go with you. So if that is indeed the case... Are we going to develop a treasure here? Is our heart going to be in this world that we are going to live and itself will be destroyed with fire one day? Or are we going to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where nothing can destroy it, where nothing will destroy us, where we will exist in the presence of God for all eternity. You see, the choice is ours. And the choice is to be made right now. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn, just flip over for just a moment to Matthew chapter 13 because three times during this lesson this morning I'm going to come back to Matthew 13. So I just want to save you a little time because I want you to take a look at something because I was looking up one verse of Scripture and I realized how wonderfully these verses went with the entire passage we're looking at today. First thing that I want us to do to conclude this first point is I want us to take a look at Matthew 13 verse 44. Because in determining where our treasure is, in determining where our heart is, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again and from joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. I want to simply ask you this question. Would you go and sell all that you have in order to acquire heaven? Now that's one of those questions that's easy to answer on the surface. We all would say yes. The church would say amen. But question. If heaven is so important to us, why don't we come back to worship God on Sunday night? Why don't we come back on Wednesdays? When we have gospel meetings, why do we sometimes have greater attendance by visiting congregations than we do from some of our own people? Why don't we study our Bibles every day? Why do some Bibles, why are they left untouched from one Sunday to the next? Why do we not stop and pray numerous times throughout our day in order to talk to our God, to share our concerns with Him, to ask Him for His gracious help in the cares of our lives? Why is it that we don't consider what we're saying and how we're saying a little bit better? Why don't we clean up our language and clean up our thoughts more than we do? You see, the person in Matthew 13 and verse 44 who finds that treasure hidden in the field, he values that treasure more than anything else. And he's willing to go and sell everything that he's got to acquire it. The question for us this morning is, is there anything in this world that we love more than God? And only we individually can answer that question. But if there's anything that we treasure more than God, then that indeed is where our heart's going to be. And what Jesus would say is, we have our reward in full right here, right now, because we do not have anything to look forward to favorably in the time to come. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23 is the second part of our passage. Jesus said, the eye is the lamp of the body. 
So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, once again, we have a choice here. A choice of where we're going to set the gaze of our eyes. Now, when it talks about, and some of your translations will use different wording in verse 22, but it talks about in the New American Standard, the eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. Versus if your eye is bad. Now, the idea here in the language that's being used is, is there something that is causing your vision to be impaired? Is there, is there something that is in the way of what you're seeing? Certainly, what John writes in 1 John 2 and verse 16 from a spiritual standpoint tells us that there is all kinds of things that the world would throw in our way to cause problems. It talks about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. Well, what are the lust of the eyes? It's those things that would spiritually get in our way. But what it's talking about in a more physical sense, in a more literal sense, is those things that cause our vision to be flawed in some way. Uh, obviously, that would be the case if we could not see at all. But there's a condition that we're aware of in the 21st century called macular degeneration. And if you're familiar with that particular situation, as my wife's grandmother was before her passing, it is a condition that often impairs the central vision of the eyes. You can sometimes see peripherally. If I'm looking straight out at you, I might be able to see Harry over here, or I might be able to see Bill over there, but all of you in the center section and most of you in the center surrounding sections, I would not be able to see. They can see somewhat from the sides perhaps, top or bottom, but they can't see what they're looking at. Well, I want you to consider that for just a moment. If there is something like that in our lives spiritually, it prevents us from seeing what we need to see. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 tells us just exactly what we are to fix our eyes upon. It reads, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so e easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We are to fix our eyes on the prize. We are to cast our gaze on Jesus and we are to be singularly focused on Him. The problem is when we allow other things to get in the way. And whether you talk about it from a physical standpoint or a spiritual standpoint, the example that's given to us in Luke chapter 6, verses 41 and 42 is, is a great passage of Scripture because it talks about our own hypocrisy when we try to tell other people how to see when we're not seeing well ourselves. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck that is in, out that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck that is out that is in your brother's eye. My brother is an ophthalmologist and if you understand what that is, that is an eye surgeon. If you've ever had cataract surgery, you went to an ophthalmologist. And my brother Larry does in the course of a, of a surgical day a lot of surgeries from sun up to sundown and even into the uh, dark hours of the day and night. And one of the things that he does is not only does he get himself right above the person upon which he's going to be doing that surgery, but he wears additional instrumentation on his head that will allow him to see even better, that will allow him to focus on just exactly what it is that he's doing. Because how many of us would want a blind ophthalmologist doing our cataract surgery? How many of us would want 
the ophthalmologist maybe even with one eye patch on on side kind of looking like a pirate you know I want guys with depth perception I want both eyes working if they're going to be working on me and so Larry does everything that he can to make sure that he can see he can see directly and he can see singularly what it is that he's focused on for him to have something in his eye whether it be a speck or a log as the examples mentioned here would certainly not help him to perform surgery in fact it would probably be disastrous for the patient think about us if we do not make the choice to see Jesus to focus our lives on him then the result is going to be disastrous the result is not going to be heaven so if you're still in Matthew 13 with your finger stuck there, take a look at Matthew 13, verses 45 and 46. Jesus says again, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now he sees something that is beautiful. He sees something that is of great value. And when he fixes his gaze upon that, he can think about nothing else other than possessing it. Now that's the question for us. Once again, is Jesus Christ your pearl of great price? Is Jesus Christ my pearl of great price? When we, once upon a time, when someone shared the gospel message with us and we fixed our eyes on the prize, when we saw Jesus and the salvation that He offers, and we embraced that by obedience to His commands, did we value Him above all others? Once again, that's an easy question to ask when you're talking about somebody who's about to put on Christ in baptism because they are very single-minded a lot of times at that point in time. They are very devoted. They, they are very excited. We would use the term on fire for the Lord. And they come up out of the waters of baptism and they're ready. They're ready to take on the world. They're ready to take on Satan. They're ready to overcome sin. They're ready to, to live the gospel message. And they're ready to share that message with everyone around them. And then that fire starts to blaze a little less brightly. It starts to dim. It starts to fade. Why? Because that which we saw as having so great a value in our life at one point in time, we don't see it the same way. Things are getting in our eyes, specks, maybe even whole logs of the world are starting to impair our spiritual vision. And as a result, we no longer see Him with the clarity that we once saw Him. And as a result... We do not value Him like we once did. And yet, we must. We must. We need to figure out a way to get that two before out of our eyes. We need to figure out a way to clean what's causing our visual impairment. And we need to get back to valuing Jesus and realizing that there is nothing more valuable than Jesus in this world. Take a look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and, ha and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, we've talked about wealth a good bit. We've talked about money and possessions and things that we value financially in this world. And so it's, it's little wonder why Jesus actually uses this terminology. You cannot serve God and mammon, or you cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and wealth, because wealth does have a strong attraction to many, and it has a great power over many. Wealth itself not being wrong, it's not money that's the root of all evil, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil, and so if we love money to the point that we allow it to become the master of our lives, then we've lost 
the gift that's being offered to us by the one who should be the master of our lives. You cannot serve two masters, and yet so many people think they can. You know, the word in the New Testament, Lord, means master. And it's interesting that Jesus would say in Luke 6 and verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That's a good point. Why do you call Jesus your master? Why do you say that he has control over the words of your lips, over the thoughts of your heart, over the actions of your life? Why do you call him master and yet don't obey him? Don't follow his instructions. Don't follow his will. Now somebody says, well, but Kevin, we do a pretty good job of that. Well, <laughs> how can I argue that point? Because look at the people who are here this morning with their Bibles open, with their songbooks open, offering prayers to God, remembering the blood and, and the body of our Lord that was sacrificed on the cross, giving of their means. Look at these people who have gathered together. Yes, in many ways we are doing a good job from the standpoint of doing good deeds, but are we obeying all that He's commanded? How many times do we read Matthew and say, I agree with that. Mark, I agree with that. Luke, I agree with that. John, I agree with that. Acts, I agree with that. Romans? Well, I don't like that so much. But now first and second Corinthians, that's pretty good. And you go on, well, guess what? That's what some religious people did in times past. You remember the religious reformer of the 1500s, Martin Luther? Uh, he was one of those guys that went through the New Testament and he said, yeah, I like it, I like it, I like it, I like it until he got to the book of James. And he didn't like James. He didn't like the whole book. Why? Because James made it abundantly clear you've got to obey. And Martin Luther said, well, well obedience, that, that can't have anything to do with our salvation. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Sounds to me like that has something to do with our salvation. And James is a book that is filled with this idea that faith without works is dead. So when we talk about masters, we have to realize it doesn't mean that there won't be people in our lives that have authority over us. I have a lot of people in my life who has authority over me. I've got two elders in this congregation who have authority over me. I have a police force in this community that has authority over me. I've got governing officials from the local all the way up to the federal level who have authority over me. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about who has the authority over you. Who is the master of your life because you can't have two. You can't have two these. You can only have one. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Once again, a passage of Scripture that I was looking for is embodied in the text that we're just about to read. But as I'm sitting here talking about having two masters and how many times people try to have two masters, what are they doing? They're trying to walk down the middle of the road. They're trying to straddle the fence. They're trying to have it both ways. They're trying to have God as the master of their life, but trying to allow the world to be master of their lives as well. And so what passage would I go to? Well, I'd go to that verse of Scripture that talks about being lukewarm. You need to be hot or cold. You can't be lukewarm. And that's in Revelation chapter 3. But as I realized, I can't just read that one verse. Because do you realize that Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22 the letter to the church at Laodicea, do you realize that it is everything we've been talking about this morning? It's not just about the lukewarm and the hot and the cold. It's about everything that we've been talking about this morning. Read with me, if you will, starting in verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, 
and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Do you realize what he's talking about? He's talking about people who lay up their treasures in the world, in their riches, in their goods. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you can become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you can see. You know what he's talking about there? The eye that is the light of the body. The eye that needs to be focused not on that which is lukewarm, not on that which is in the middle, but that which is clearly our master. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father. On his throne. Do you know what he's saying here? Do you know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, I am the master. And there is no way to heaven without me. You cannot have two masters. You cannot divide your interests. You cannot live the days of your lives wondering, well, I wonder how I'm going to live today. Or I wonder for whom I'm going to live today. How am I going to act in this situation? How am I going to react in that situation? We cannot live our lives wondering. We need to make a decision so that the choice is already determined. And in so doing, we live our lives under that authority of the one true master of the universe and the one who has prepared a home in heaven for us to which we want to be a part one day. I said we would go back to Matthew 13 one more time, and that's what we're going to do. In Matthew 13, verses 47 through 50, Jesus gives us another parable. And he says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers but the bad fish they threw away so it will be at the end of the age the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in the same way that the good fish are separated from the bad fish the good fish are saved and the bad fish are cast aside if we don't make the choice as to who is our master the same is going to be made for us but it's not going to be made in this world and in this time for some temporary form of punishment it's going to be made on judgment day in the spiritual realm for all of eternity We're not to Matthew 6.33 yet. About a week off. But I have to foreshadow something that Jesus is going to say that very nicely sums up our lesson this morning. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What is the choice that is before us today? The choice is to seek Jesus first. Let Him be our treasure because He is where our heart is. Let our eyes be focused on Him and let it be clear in our minds and in our lives so that all others around us don't have to question, are you a Christian? Are you a disciple of Christ? Are you a follower of Jesus, let that be clear that we've made the choice as to who our master is. We've decided to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and He's going to take care of us. He'll take care of us now, but He most definitely is going to take care of us in the life to come. 
This morning, what is your choice? If you're not a Christian, if you're not a child of God, if you have not chosen to put on Christ in baptism, there is no better time to make that choice than right now. And if you are a child of God, one of those people that came up out of the waters of baptism one time so very excited, but something's changed. That excitement has faded a little bit. Uh, it, it has gone the way of some of the treasures of this world that rust and are corrupted. And, and maybe we've set our feet back into the world once again. Make a choice now to change and get back on track with the Lord. Ask Him for forgiveness. And with a penitent heart, He'll answer that prayer. And if there's something that we can do to help you, as we ask you to pray for and help us, that we all might make the choices that will please God and give us that eternal home in heaven. If there is that condition out there this morning and we can help you in any way, let us know how we can while together we stand and sing.